Hey everyone, today we have an Alesis QS8 synthesizer. This is a synth that I've been looking for for quite some time. It's a 88 key hammer action synth, which is, at the time this was built, this was Alesis' flagship model, which came out in the mid to late 90s, I believe this one was. They followed it up with the QS8.1, then the QS8.2 into the 2000s. The quality of this synth was very, very good. It's still popular today, mostly because of its piano action feel, and you can get them quite reasonably priced on eBay and other used sources. This particular one is not working, which is what we're going to be looking at today. Description from the eBay auction was, needs new battery, and that was pretty much it. From the pictures, it looked like it was in pretty good shape, and upon receiving it, it is. I was amazed. Uh, you never know how shipping is going to go with some sellers, but this one was pretty well packed. It's got some light scuffs and scratches and some nicks here or there on it. The end pieces are actually wood on this synth as well, and they're both in really, really good shape. They're not beat up at all. Overall, I'm pretty happy with the condition of it. I'm going to look at it in a little bit closer detail here in a minute. I have already powered this up. It powers up like it showed in the picture in the auction. The LCD lights up. The LCD is a little bit scrambled, so there's something going on there that we got to look at. But there is no audio, both out of the headphone jack or the line-out jacks. So there is something wrong with this. Maybe a reset will fix it. I'm not sure. I haven't tried that. I've literally just unboxed this upstairs, brought it downstairs, put it on my bench, powered it up, and realized there was no audio. So we'll look into it in a little bit more detail here now. Here we are at the front of the QS8. I've got it hooked up to power. I've got the audio out going to a small mixer through some speakers. So powering it up now, you can see it comes on. The display backlight works. The display itself is a little odd. There's some garbled characters there. And actually going through the menus, ah, or at least just picking the, the different uh, categories of sounds. Anyway, the display is updating. So at least the CPU internals of this unit is, is alive and working there. The display itself is stuck. So this display is most likely Hitachi HD 44780 standard. What is a 20 character by 2 line LCD display that I'm not worried about if that's if that's bad and I think it may be bad because you you clock in typically parallel data to this display and from there it has its own micro internal microprocessor that that actually does the character generation and readout so it's getting the data it's just it's not displaying it correctly so in terms of display I'm hoping that it is just the display and that's all that's wrong there but it still doesn't explain the issue of the no sound which I need to look in next so I've tried both the headphone out and the line out, and there's also a secondary auxiliary out. None of them are providing any audio whatsoever. So I'm going to have to open it up and take a look inside. Turning the unit around, one thing that caught my eye right away was right here, some rust along with in there, and that switch for the serial interface. So I'm a bit worried that this unit's been wet and water has been in there. It's possible it could have just been damp water on the outside that... that you know, rusted that connector there, but uh, some of the screws themselves too, not here, but on the ends, they look like they're a little rusty. And overall parts of the case too, just kind of look like, uh, maybe, maybe not. Like it's just been damp or wet. So I'm not sure about that. I won't know until we open it up and take a look inside. Before I went ahead and opened this, I did want to try the factory reset on there. I Pulled the manual real quick and found you hold 0 and 3 while powering it on, which apparently clears it to factory defaults. There is a 3 volt lithium battery in these, I believe, that like all gear this era is probably dead unless it's been replaced here in the past before, but it's it's a possibility that, that the ROM in this could be corrupted or something could be in a weird state because that battery's dead. I don't know. So I was just going to try that real quick just to see. So 0, 3, power on. I got sound. That was different. I don't know if I have to hold it or if that's good. It says okay. All right, I've got sound. Look at that. So I do have sound, which is awesome. I didn't have that before. Now the display, bring the camera over, is still a mess. But at least there is sound. Beautiful. 
All right, let's get it open and take a look. I apparently don't have a big enough bench to work on this thing. It, uh, first of all, it's heavy. This is, I don't know how much it weighs. I'll look up the uh, actual weight on it. But it's a, it's a beast to move around. So there's a handful of screws in the bottom, handful of screws in the back. And then flip it back over and it lifts out pretty easy. So uh, let me get the camera over so we can look closer. All right, here's an overhead view of the main board in the QS8. Initial look is good. I'm not seeing any water damage, minus just a little bit of corrosion back here um, near that jack. So I'm still going to clean that off. I might have to pull the board out still to take a look at that. But besides that, it doesn't look bad. This unit actually came apart really easy. It's easy to work on, which is nice. I can still test it here on the bench while I work on it because I still have access to the front panel there, which is really, really nice. So I'm pretty happy with the way the inside looks here. I'm going to clean it. It really needs a good clean. This whole synth is pretty dirty. I don't know if it's in somebody's garage or what, but see even the keys, the whole thing just needs a really thorough cleaning. Like I said, I may take that board out completely too, just so I can check the bottom of it and make sure that the little bit of corrosion or rust on the back there isn't causing any problems. The LCD is mounted up here, which is nice because that will make it really easy to access. It does look like a standard and the pinout looks like the standard Hitachi pinout. I'll have to check that though to be sure. Uh, the rest of the buttons have that ribbon cable there. This goes over to the control sliders. Which, those sliders are really crusty too, so I'm going to take that board off. Clean those sliders, make them feel smooth again. Because they move really, really kind of nasty right now. And then over on this side you've got your modulation and uh, pitch bender. Which is basically potentiometers. So I didn't really test those yet. They feel really nice though, so hopefully they won't need anything. Alesis, some like the Roland instruments, has a standard IEC 3-pin connector, so you can use any standard IEC power cord, but you have a million laying around, which is kind of nice. Roland always uses their weird 2-pin connector that's almost the same size, but the IEC cords won't fit, so a lot of people swap out the uh, power inlet with a, on the Roland gear with the standard one, but you don't need to worry about that with this, which is really nice. All right, let's test that battery before I do anything else. Okay, top side's positive. Ground, you should be able to just probe anywhere. So I'll just hit one of these jacks. So 2.991, that's a three volt battery. That's actually doesn't, it's not low, not that low anyway. It's kind of worrisome. I'll have to power it back on, I guess, and see if it still has the same symptoms as it did before. But well, that battery is not showing any issue. I may just replace it anyway, I have some. Actually, I'm probably gonna throw in a socket so I can just stick a standard three volt in there. Before I do anything else, I thought I'd just take a look at the inside on the main board here and kind of see what's going on. So starting from the left, we have a simple linear power, su power supply, nothing really remarkable there at all. Uh, linear regulator here, I'm assuming it's a 7805. I can't tell, I can't really see it there handful of caps on the power supply as well. So those are Nishikons. So nice caps. I can't see if they're 105. Looks like they're 105 degree rated. No, nope, only 85. Yeah, so those are only 85 degree rated. Based on how old this unit is too, I might just replace all the caps on the main board. There's not that many. There's 12 here total. I'm sure I probably have them all in stock. So I may just do that for a precaution. I don't know if they're leaking. I don't see any signs of leaking, but no reason really not to based on the age. So moving to the right, there's a lot of Elisa's branded chips in here. Almost everything, which is interesting. So both of these guys right here are Elisa's branded. All these, I'm assuming this is the ROM. This whole bank here uh, it goes over a little bit further off camera. I'll show it here in a second. But even those are Elisa's branded, even though they are MX chips. Big EEPROM here. Love it, 27C240-10. And then we have a small Hitachi microprocessor here. I'll have to take a closer look at that, see what the actual model number is. Some SRAM with that, and a little GAL programmable array right there, which is kind of interesting. Sliding over the board a little bit, you can see the rest of these ROMs. That's weird. The keyboard's kind of actually sitting on that cable. So 
These have to be the ROMs for all the sounds. I forget how much memory in ROM and samples this has inside. That was one of the things that Elisus did at the time that made it very, very popular was the the grand, the grand piano sample that was on this along with a handful of other instruments were really, really good and they needed a lot of memory to, the, to do that. So I'm assuming that's what all that, all that, uh, those chips are right there is the actual ROM. Uh, another chip here, Elisus branded. It's labeled Keyscan, so that must be interface off the front keypad there, which would make sense. Actually, a lot of these things are actually labeled on there as far as what they are. This is kind of funny over here. So, Elisus had a QS6, QS7, and QS8. The QS6 was the 61 key version of this synth. The QS7 was the 76 key, and the QS8 was the 88 key. So the QS7 and QS8 had the same ROM banks, which makes sense here looking at it because these cables are coming off the keyboard on the front, uh, from the front down below right here, and they're labeled 88 lower, 88 upper. And then above it we have 76 upper, which they probably, this is what they would use for the 76 key version of this synth. There's also a 76 lower that's unpopulated, which is kind of funny. I wonder why they populated just that jack on the QS88 model, but not the 76 lower. So kind of strange there about that. Uh, besides that, PCI MCA slots for additional ROM cards. And then if you can see actually a little bit of corrosion back in here on the board around that uh, serial input jack. But that's what I'm kind of, uh, I want to be cautious about. I want to take the board out and clean that up and just make sure that there's not going to be any issues there. This whole board should pop out pretty easy. Handful of screws on it, then I just got to loosen all the nuts on the back jacks for the actual audio inputs, or the audio outputs and then foot pedal inputs. So, that's it here. Here we are with the board removed, and you can see a pretty good picture here of the corrosion that's on that connector. It's isolated just to that one spot on the switch and on that serial, on that proprietary serial port. It's kind of in between the jacks there, but it doesn't look too bad. So I'm just going to clean that up real quick get some deoxid in there and, and wipe it up with some alcohol when I'm done but I don't think that's too concerning so I'm happy about that while well, I'm in here I'm gonna replace these two 2200 microfarad 16 volt capacitors on the power supply again strictly precautionary I'll test it once it's out to see if the actual cap is good or not but they're just concerning because they're really close to a regulator inside here and again based on the age I don't know how warm it gets in there, but we're talking 20 years old at this point. And this, you know, I don't know the history of this synth too. Being studio gear, it could be on all the time, never shut off. So it's it's hard to say how much actual life is or uh, how much use it's had anyway. So. Top side of the board is clean, so no worries there. I'm putting Panasonic 105 degrees Celsius rated caps in this guy. hard working on the camera trying to see what you're doing in frame instead of just looking at the work. Alright. So another problem I came across when I was testing this was a couple of the keys were actually dead. They weren't producing any sound. There's only three, two or three that I counted though. Two were for sure, one was iffy. So I'm thinking it's just dirty contacts across the, uh, the sensors that the synth uses. I don't actually know what the sensors are. I, I flipped it over. I'm about to pull the cover off here. I pulled all the screws off. The screws are a little crusty and rusty too, so I'm, I want to take a look at the bottom of this. But a handful of screws and pull the cover off. Uh, there is a Elisis 
quality control sticker on the bottom too. So manufacturer date 62296. So 1996 when this thing was built. So just over 20 years old. So this should just lift up. Of course it's not though. Crusty down there. It should be clean old though. These cables are for the aftertouch. I saw them labeled on the uh, top side. This is See all the crust and crap under there. It definitely needs this whole thing needs a good cleaning. I've been cleaning it a little bit as I've gone through it. It needs a, a lot more though, so I'll be cleaning it pretty thoroughly as I put it back together. So the hammer portion of these keys has just this layer of just white corrosion on there. I don't know exactly what it is, but it's everywhere across all of them. It doesn't really impact anything being on the bottom. It's still gross. I debate if how what's the easiest way to clean that or not because I don't want it all to fall into the keys just to have it all fall out when I flip it so I need to figure out where the actual sensors are for the keys themselves the, there should be some type of velocity sensor so a hundred screws later and I have the actual key contact assembly removed it consists of a rubber contact assembly something similar that you find in a, a regular remote control where you have your little rubber conductive pads that make contact to certain pads on the on the PCB itself. These are a little bit dirty so I'm going to go through and clean every single one of them. There's a whole row obviously a total of 88 for the entire keyboard. This is just one half of it. I have to go to the other half as well. But they do look a little dirty like I mentioned so I think just running some alcohol through the pads and the contacts will clean everything up rather nice. I was stupid and didn't know what keys were actually not working, so I don't remember, but I'm just going to clean everything anyway and make it all consistent. I didn't verify velocity or anything else on any of the keys either, so there could be variations in there. Cleaning everything to the same standard should help alleviate any problems going forward. Here's a close-up of the pads once they have, once they're dirty. You can actually see the residue. It shows up kind of shiny on the camera right here. That's what you end up having to clean off. This basically makes these non-conductive, and that's what causes them to stop working. These are used in all sorts of things. TV remotes have the exact same problem. When you have TV remotes that, that or any type of remote that is intermittent and the buttons don't work, usually this needs to be these need to be cleaned. Once they're cleaned, they should look like this. This one I just cleaned with isopropyl alcohol, and you can see the difference in the the way the actual pads look. Another tip too is, is over time if these are used enough, especially in again TV remotes, the actual conductive surface on there can get completely worn out and it no longer conducts. There's nothing to clean, there's, there's nothing left there. You can actually bring them back to life or repair these by taking a pair of snippers and snipping off the top of this pad here, removing it. Then take, grab a, uh, another remote control, a donor remote that you don't need anymore that's, that's junk or whatever to a device that's no longer working or any old remote, cut those pads off from it and then you can super glue them on the piece of rubber here in place of the existing one that wasn't working. Once that dries you put it back together and you you restore the functionality of that remote. So it's a good tip to, for any of the cases that you come across these where these are actually worn out. Alright, I have all the contacts cleaned, I have the boards reinstalled and I've got everything else back together. I went through while the keys were out too and I took it over on the floor and tried to clean up some of the corrosion on the on the metal hammers. It was relatively successful. They're still not pretty, but I got rid of most of the, the at least the corrosion that was flaking off of there anyway, so it could be done better, but it just requires so much work. You almost have to take every hammer out and clean it individually just to be able to get in between them to, to do it best. But it's purely cosmetic. It's not impacting anything. I just don't like it, but I'm going to deal with it for now. In terms of going through the synth first, it might be something that I go back and, and deal with on another, on another day. We'll see though.
With the board back in, I wanted to talk about a few things real quick. First of all, here's those two caps that I replaced with the Panasonic 105 degree units. The old caps that were in there, I tested them both. One tested fine, the other one wouldn't even show up as any capacitance on my Agilent uh, capacitance meter. So I don't have any gear that can test ESR or anything you know, more complex than that, but that cap was not functioning, or at least not showing the correct capacitance it should. And my suspicion is, is due to the proximity of this regulator right here. So there's a 7805 on, that doesn't have a heat sink snuck right next to these caps. I hate when designs do this. There's plenty of room in the board. They could have given it a little bit of space, but my suspicion is, is that this heat sink here, which after this unit's on for a while, it's hot enough where you can't, you can't touch it. You can't keep your finger on it. It'll burn you. That that's actually just cooking that capacitor away. Again, being old and just an 85 degree unit, I'm sure that it was not no longer at its rated capacitance anyway. Uh, secondly, this battery, uh, I'm gonna leave it right now. They tested fine in terms of voltage. And I looked real quick and I wanted to put a socket in there so I could just replace it in the future if I ever needed to, but the sockets I have don't quite have the correct pin out. So to make this work in there, I'd have to kind of put it in at an angle and just, I don't know, it wouldn't look right. So I could either build a daughter board mount that on there and have that mount to the board or try to find a proper socket for that but I'm not gonna do neither right now again the battery's fine so it's not a big deal at the moment the next thing to fix is the LCD so the LCD just pops out of the front panel uh, it just sits here like that and I misspoke earlier I said it was a 20 character by 2 line it's actually a 16 character by 2 line uh, the connector also mounts on the end which looking through my LCDs most of what I have has the top or the bottom mount uh, type connector. So I found two that will fit here and the ones that I have. This one's a blue inverted, which I like. I like the inverted displays. I think they just look nicer. The backlight isn't as bright on them. A lot of Roland gear typically has the inverted displays, including my JV80, which I really, really like. So I think I'm going to try that. This one's also just a standard white display. And somewhere around I've got a green one too. So I'm not sure where that is at the moment, though I can't find it, but I'm going to use the blue at the moment. So with that, I'm going to not just, well, I'm going to have to cut that cable and wire it directly to the LCD, but I'm not going to solder it directly to it. I'm actually going to put some pin headers on there. That way I can swap it out in the future if I ever need to. It'll just be easier if I do want to change my mind, I want to change the color of it, plus just uh, for portability I want to leave the, the socket of the building on there just to make it easy to repair and unplug it at that point too which is kind of nice so I'll be working on that next okay I've got the new LCD wired in right here I ended up going with a white display instead of the blue like I talked about I actually thought that it's got a little bit nicer color to it a little bit better contrast compared to the, the blue so it looked really nice. I was pretty happy with it. Now, Alesis did something weird with this LCD off the main board. They swapped the data lines alternately for every data pin coming off of there. I'm not sure exactly why that is. I don't know if it's because on the old display, the way they had mounted it, the pins coming off the bottom instead of the top, reversed it. But it threw me for a second because I was still getting some, some weird data after replacing the LCD. But once I realized what was going on and swapped the pins, it was fine after that. So LCD is good. What's nice is for whatever reason, I mean, these displays I buy off eBay from China for just a couple dollars. It's amazing how cheap they are. But the frames are the exact same size as the old one. And it snaps right into the window, no problem, which is great. So I don't have to make any modifications to the, the mount for the actual display itself. So while I was in here, I went ahead and cleaned all the potentiometers. So. They're basically, there's five linear sliders on there. Four of them are data inputs for the different parameters that you can control with the synth itself. The fifth one is the volume control. This whole thing was extremely crusty. I, I took it over to my other bench and cleaned it there just because it was really messy. I, I took a picture of it, I'll show it here. But you, you can definitely see the water penetration that got in there. Luckily, nothing was damaged. It was all surface rust. So all the rust stains in the board cleaned off completely. Potentiometers cleaned up themselves, no problem. I then cleaned the pots with my MCL contact lubricant, which I've used before, and stuff works great. They feel great now, they slide great. They all worked before, they just didn't feel well. They felt you know, 
know, it's scratchy. But I didn't hear any audio issues or anything like that. Now the volume control on the far left is the only one that audio actually passes through. That's through this shielded cable here. All the other pins, or both the shield cables I should say, but all the other pins are just data lines. So there's an analog digital converter that's reading that off the board here that's actually adjusting all the parameters. All the pots are good now. I also cleaned all the surface rust off any exposed metal too because all these had some light surface rust on them. Minus I didn't bother pulling the whole number pad off here just because it was fine. But everything else exposed I cleaned up. And I spent another hour or two just going through and cleaning more and more and more as well just because this thing was just filthy on the inside. Looking at the inside of the main board here just a little bit closer, I just wanted to note, uh, note a few little things. So this chip is actually the SRAM um, that's battery backed up. So this holds all your user presets and any modifications you make to any of the parameters on the synth. Um, so that's all that battery is doing is backing up this SRAM. So even if the battery goes dead or you replace it, all you're going to do is lose all of your, your presets out of this chip here. So this chip is labeled DSP-1. Now, the, this QS8 and the QS7 have an Alesis Quadriverb effects processor built into them. And I would have to open my Quadriverb back up, but I believe this was the same chip that was in the Quadriverb. I don't remember offhand, though, exactly. That's actually tied to this DRAM chip right next to it here, so it would make sense. But I'm kind of curious about that to look at. So the last thing I was curious about is just what they were using for their actual digital analog conversion in here. And these two chips right here are actually the to a converters one for each channel those are ak4319 they're delta sigma uh, digital analog converters pretty high spec so they've spent good money on good digital analog converters would so make sense lastly they've got an ne5532d op amp right there and that's right near the headphone outputs and the other also uh, left right and auxiliary outputs that is a dual channel op amp pretty high spec so they may be using that just to drive the headphone amplifier or it might be driving all outputs together possibly with attenuators on the actual line outputs. I'm not sure exactly. Again, I don't have a schematic and I didn't follow the traces on there to see what's going on, but uh, that's what they're using for the output. The microprocessor in this is made by Hitachi. It's an H8500 series. Actually, H8510 is what it says there. 16-bit uh, micro, so pretty decent spec. And with that, you can see it's tied directly to this uh, UV erasable EEPROM, which holds the firmware for the actual device itself. Firmware on this is version 1.01, .01, dated, looks like 7896, uh, labeled Q8 as well. So we know that this one is specifically for the QS8. For the QS7, they probably have a different EEPROM in there since a different uh, key configuration, even though it is the same board. So we're all back together, tested out. Everything seems to be working just fine, which makes me really, really happy. Sounds awesome. Went through every single key. Every key is working, both in terms of on-off and velocity. Uh, in summary, so it, it, the thing was just filthy. Needed tons of cleaning, some corrosion inside. None of it was really impacting, but just I just wanted it cleaned up. Besides that, needed a new LCD. I replaced the caps and the power supply. And lots of corrosion cleaning. Cleaned all, every single key switch, both the sensor and the actual keypad itself, and we're good. So I'm super happy with this. It actually cleaned up really nice. I also went through with some plastic cleaner and kind of hit all the keys along with the side panels. And then I, uh, I cleaned up the LCD actual bezel a little bit too. It was a little scratched, so it looks much better now. All the actual membrane keypads on the, on the unit itself were cleaned. But it, it, I'm super, super happy with it. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this repair video. And that's it for now.